Okay, so we begin tonight, we're in Galatians chapter 1, looking at verses 6 through 12, and uh, I'm excited about tonight, as I was studying through, I listened to several different preachers uh, on this topic, because like, there's a lot of different directions that I thought I could go, but as I studied, it came pretty clear to me about three major points that we're going to look at tonight, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, and the question and the thought is, is what are you doing? When we think about grace and peace, and we think about the grace and peace that God has given us, we think about, you know, what are we doing with this grace and peace that the Lord has given us, okay? And this is uh, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. And in most of your Bibles, it's going to be verses 6 through 10, and then 11 to 12 begins the next section. But as I looked at it and as I studied, I felt like that's not really the best place, in my opinion, to break it. Now, understand that small subtitles and chapters and verses as they're written in the Bible, that's not inspired by God. That was created by man for our benefit. So like I could tell you, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Galatians chapter 1, verse 12, whatever it may be, so that we can all follow along while the preacher is preaching and you could follow along. So understand, this was one full straight up letter from the beginning where he says Paul an apostle all the way to the end of Galatians where he says amen that was one letter like if you were to write down and say you know what I'm gonna write a letter to a friend I haven't seen in a really long time I think it would be really good if I wrote back to them and told them a little bit about what's going on what I'm doing right now who I am you know how things have changed I think that's kind of what Paul has written you know in the last week we talked about him being an apostle and he talked about the gospel that he had uh, preached to them and he had taught them okay and so we know that the gospel as I have spoken to y'all many a time especially during 2020 we walked through James and we talked about uh, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ we need to know the gospel Jesus was born of a virgin He lived a life without sin. He died on the cross in our place for our sins. He rose again and he's coming again. Those are the five tenets of the gospel. We talked about that. We have talked about that at end's length. We've talked about different verses that are very good to use in sharing the gospel. What is uh, one verse in particular that, that is really good to use when sharing the gospel is Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That has got everything compact that you need to be able to expound on and explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, there's John 3, 16. You can use that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him will not perish but have eternal life. There's a little bit of a challenge in that particular text on trying to pull out sin, the reason why God sent his son. Okay, But in Romans 5, 8, it's while we were still sinners. It's very clear as to why the gospel comes to us. Paul writes in verses 3 and 4, just to go back and rehash, because tonight Paul is writing to them, and he's, he's upset. It's like I said last week. Last week I told you that Romans is kind of like in, in uh, offense, and then Galatians is like a defense. Okay, Romans, Paul is explaining the work of Christ. He's on the offensive. He's coming. He's seeking. He's doing all this. We're not doing it. Galatians, he's saying, look, You need to know this is what we believe because somebody is trying to distort the gospel. Matter of fact, he uses the word pervert the gospel. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So what is the gospel? If you have a Bible or if you have your phones out, verses 3 and 4 gives us what Paul writes as the gospel in Galatians chapter 1. So if you're looking in your Bibles, you know, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and then you've got... Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians, okay? So Galatians chapter 1, looking at verses 3 and 4 very quickly before we jump into the other parts. So what is the gospel? What does the word gospel mean? Good news, good news, that's right. Gospel means good news, okay? And last week we talked about the good news of Jesus Christ. And so the good news is this, verse 3 and 4, this is a little bit changed from what's in the text. But Jesus gave himself for our sins. Why? So to deliver us from this evil way of life. And he did that through obedience to the Father. That's in verses 3 and 4. That's just a little bit snugged up, kind of tight right there of what, what the Scripture says. Okay? That's what Jesus did. He gave himself for our sins. And then in verse 6, we see where Paul says it's shocking. I, am, I marvel at what you're doing. I am shocked at you. 
Okay? And we're looking at verses 6 through 9. So when we look at verses 6 through 9, he says, I am shocked. Um, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but these are some that trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And then in verse 9, he reemphasizes this again, and he says, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And we're going to stop right there and for just a moment. And Paul says this, it's shocking. In the New Living Translations, he says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from the grace by which you've been called in Christ Jesus. Listen, it's a good grace. And when Paul wrote that I, I, I come to you with grace to you and peace from our God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, that is a grace and a peace that we should never just move past or add to. It is God's grace. Uh, I quoted Ephesians 2.8 last week. For it is by grace through faith that you are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is the gift of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul is marveling. It blows my mind when people say they are leaving the faith. Uh, because it's shocking to think. What's better than to know that the God of all creation has come to earth, died in our place for our sins, and we don't have to be held accountable for that anymore? Because Christ has died on the cross in our place, the sins that we commit, we don't have to be held accountable for that. Where God was angry about sin, where God has wrath about sin, it was all placed on Jesus. So what is there that's better what is there that's better? There's nothing better to know than to know Jesus. To know that Jesus died on the cross in my place. The sins that I have committed, the sins that I am committing or will commit. Right now, I'm not currently in a sin, but like the sins that I have committed or the sins that I will commit, they've all been accounted for. And as I, as I will sin, because I still have human nature to me, all I've got to do is go before the Lord. As 1 John 1, 9 says, that if you will confess your sins unto him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's, it's just as if we've never sinned before. If we will confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised us up from the dead, we will be saved. We are saved and we will be saved. So he tells us, I am, I am shocked as the New Living Translation puts it, that you are turning away so soon. Listen, this ain't been long. This hasn't been long since Christ walked on the earth and Jesus Christ gave them the gospel, lived the gospel before them. And he's like, this is blowing my mind. This blows my mind. You know, it's like if you got something brand new and then like one week later you're like, this just ain't good enough. This just ain't good enough. You know? I mean, it's brand new. There's nothing better than whatever it is that you just got, for example. Let's say you get an iPhone 12 that's purple, which is the brand new color, just came out like two weeks ago. Okay, and you're like, this ain't good enough. My mom and dad got it for me, but this ain't good enough. That would be pretty sad, you know? I mean, you've got top-of-the-line technology, man. It's awesome, and it's, you know, I mean, not purple's not my favorite color or anything like that but like you're like this is purple and all these things are great about this but you know what it ain't good enough well there's nothing yet better than that now people who have samsung's may argue and say our phones are better yeah, I'm, okay just 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 playing just playing around here follow me okay but listen when jesus christ came and jesus christ died in our place there will never be anything better there will be there will never be another god like him he is, like I said, 100% God. He is 100% man. There's nobody. There is nothing that anybody can do that is greater than what Christ did. And that was to put on flesh, to live a life without sin, to die in our place and rise again. Nobody else is going to do that. Nobody else is going to do that. He is the only one that did that. And Paul is telling those churches there at Galatia, he says, I am marveling that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. 
in, in the way the New Living Translation puts it, uh, turning away so soon uh, from himself, um, excuse me, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you uh, to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You know, when I think about how merciful God is, you know, he has every right within him to just say, I'm going to wipe everybody out and start all over. But in mercy and in grace, he says, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I created them. I created them in my image. And because I did so, I'm going to give of myself so that they may be redeemed. And that's what he did. And listen, the, these people, this, this church here at Galatia, they were going to a different gospel, which is not even another gospel. I, I love this, this phrasing. It says, you are, following a difficult, um, you are following a difficult way that pretends, a different way that pretends to be the good news. You're, you're following a different way that pretends to be the good news. You ever, you ever bought something and you thought it was a real thing and later found out it wasn't? You ever done that? Okay, like when I was a kid, we had what we called Oakleys, and it was fake Oakleys, okay, because everybody wanted Oakleys. Oakleys was the sunglasses in the 90s, okay, and then Costa kind of took over in the, in the 2000s. A lot of people wanted Costas, you know what I'm saying, and all this kind of stuff, but like when I was a teenager, it was Oakleys, and it was the big ones that covered like half your face, and they were like, oh, and then they'd buy Folkleys. And, and like they, they didn't have the O anywhere on them, they'd be, but they would be designed just like them. They were cheap, rinky-dink. You'd pay about 15, 20 bucks for them. They'd break, scratch, whatever. They weren't the real thing, okay? They were fake. They were fake Oakleys. I had one pair of Oakleys for 14 years. 14 years. And up until about a month before, or about two months before, uh, they were taken from me um, by my irresponsibility, just to be, just to be honest. Um, that was the first time they got a scratch on them. Two months before they were, before I lost, I don't want to say lost them because we found them. Uh, but, but I didn't pursue getting them back because I'd already got some new sunglasses and it was all good, you know. But listen, that those Oakleys went to Mexico with me. Those Oakleys went to Brazil with me. Those Oakleys for 14 years went on vacations with me. Uh, I got them before Brogan was even born, and, and I had them up until he was 14 years old. That's insane when you think about that, okay? It's one pair of sunglasses. And, uh, but you know what? They still didn't last. You know why? Because they're earthly material things. Jesus Christ is God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there's a lot of things that's going to come in and pretend to be your Savior. There's a lot of things that's going to come in and pretend to be a Lord in your life. But I want to tell you something. There is, no, there is nothing close to the real thing, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the one that has mercy. He is the one that has grace. And he is the one who can give peace upon receiving that grace. He is the real thing. He's not fake. He's not a pretend. It's good news because Jesus, part, Jesus Christ is a part of it. But listen, Paul goes on to write there in verse 7. He says, but there are some that trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. There are people that have come in. And listen, as you grow up and as you come through, you're going to hear people tell you different things about, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't really die. He, he kind of fell asleep, and, and then he woke up later, and he had a plan for his body to be stolen from the tomb, and all these different nonsense things. Listen, that's not the truth. If that were the case, why did the disciples run down there later to find it and then be in shock when his body wasn't there? Wouldn't you think they would be the planners and the orchestrators of the body being taken if that were the case? Yeah, okay. Why, why these Roman soldiers, why would they go back and, and then be told not to share because they, they, they were like, we're going to make up a story. They lied about what happened to Jesus, okay? They went back and they were, they were told to lie about what happened to Jesus' body. The tomb rolled away because Jesus moved it. There are some that trouble you. And listen, because you know what troubles us is like when people say that you've got to work for your salvation. The only work, and I've heard another preacher say this, and he said, the only work I did in salvation was the sinning. Jesus did all the work of the saving. Okay? 
In salvation, I did all the sinning and he did all the saving. And by grace, he came to me and offered me salvation through his wonderful mercy. And so when I think about that, when, when these people are coming in, they're telling you, no, you, you need to be baptized to be saved. Um, later on in Galatians, you're going to hear about this thing called circumcision. Oh, you've got to be circumcised to be, to be a Christian. No, no, none of that has to happen. What has to happen is by the grace of God, you place your faith in Christ. For it is by grace through faith that you are saved. It's not of works. You can't help enough people across the road. You can't be kind enough. You can't honor your mother and father enough. I mean, you need to. That's part of the Ten Commandments. But let me tell you this. What you've got to do is surrender your life to Jesus Christ by faith, confessing him as Lord and Savior. And by doing so, listen, when I do things, when I do things for Julie, there's a lot of things I don't like to do. But you know what? I love her, so therefore I do those things. Okay, there's a lot of things I don't like to do for my kids. That might sound like a terrible dad, but I love my kids, so therefore I do them. You know what? Christ asked me to do things for him. Sometimes I don't understand. Sometimes I may not even like it. He says to love our enemies. You know what? I don't know if I'm going to really like that a whole lot. But you know what, though? It don't matter what I like. It's about what I love. And I love my Savior I love the Lord. I love Jesus Christ. So I do them because I love him. And so when he calls on us, he wants us to do the things that we do because we love him. We love him because he loved us first. Some people are trying to tell you to do these works. You got to do these works. And they want to pervert the gospel. And, you know, when you think about somebody who's perverted, they're doing all kind of dirty things, you know. And, and when, you, when you mess up the gospel and when you start adding things to it, that's pretty dirty. Because Jesus already said, it's, it's, it's easy for you. Jesus said, it was hard for me. It's easy for you. It's hard for me. And these people are saying, no, 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 no. It's, it's hard for you. You got to work. You got to work hard. No, you don't. No, you don't. You just got to live. You got to live for Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Are there hard things in doing that sometimes? Yes, but that's not work. That should come out of a love for Jesus. We do what we do because we love him. Because we love him. And then Paul goes on to say there in verses 8 and 9. He reemphasizes himself in verse 9, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But verse 8, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you that than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. He's saying, look, if I even come at you and add something to this, listen, I should be cursed. And if any angel comes to you and preaches a different gospel, let them be cursed, okay? The Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they supposedly say there's a, there was an angel named Moroni that, that delivered this stuff to them, and it's a different gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ, Okay? This is, and, and so like, this is the deal. You don't listen to it because it's, it's an angel that is preaching a different gospel and it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? So he says, let them be accursed. Listen, the Bible tells us not even to wish people well on their way when they come up and try to do that stuff. When they try to tell you a different gospel other than understand that Jesus Christ has done it all. Jesus Christ submitted to the, to the leadership of God the Father And when God the Father said, Son, go get my people, if you will. He says, go die in their place. Be their substitute. Be their sacrifice. Jesus came. And he submitted himself. And he became, he put on human flesh. He was born unto a virgin. He lived a life without sin. He died in our place on the cross for our sins. He rose again. And he's coming again. And he did all that through obedience. As I've stated earlier, In verses 3 and 4 of this same chapter, through obedience to the Father. So like if anybody else is telling you anything, like you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to serve in this way for you to be saved, okay? Now listen, a lot of times for people to believe that you're saved, you should be doing things revealing your love for Christ. You know, we can't just say, I love Jesus, and be a stump on a log or, 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 be, or be lazy. 
Don't love nobody. Hate people. Don't be kind. Don't be generous. Don't be don't be under don't have self control. Don't have any patience with anybody. Those are all opposites of the fruit of the spirit. When you have the fruit of the spirit, you're going to live like Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And listen, I'm pretty sure that the Lord understands there's going to be times where we're going to be abounding in certain different fruits, fruit of the Spirit. Things that, that, that rise up in us. There's different times where we're going to be more self-controlled. There's going to be different times when we're going to be more patient. There's going to be more t- times where we're going to be more kind. And all these things are, you know, they're kind of knitted together. But listen, there's times where we're going to be high in certain areas and other times when we're, when we're going to have to pray and ask the Lord, can you help me in this area? Right now I'm struggling. And I need you, Lord. I need you. I need you to help me with my patience. Lord, I need you to help me with my kindness. I need you to help me with my gentleness, my self-control. Because when situations arise, a lot of times we want, to, we want to react in emotion. And listen, when we react in emotion, a lot of times we're letting emotion be our Lord and not letting Jesus Christ be our Lord. We, we need to be submitted to the will of the Father so that when those emotions rise up inside of us, we say, you know what? I have the Spirit of Christ living within me. I'm going to exercise self-control. God, give me self-control so that I may live as you've called me to live. Let me have patience so I may live as as you've called me to live. There in verse 9, he goes on to reemphasize what he was saying. As I have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. So what are you doing? You know, are, are are you turning to another gospel? Listen, I, I don't, it would shock me. It shocks me when I see people. It shocks me when I'm on social media and I see these people and they're either adding things to the gospel or taking things away from the gospel and then they're arguing about it. And I'm like, oh my goodness gracious, listen, if we would just understand the, the simplicity of the gospel and what Christ has done for us, listen, it would be so much better for everybody. I'm shocked because they're going to other gospels. Or, and really, it's not even a gospel. Gospel means good news. And anything that that is not Christ-centered, listen, that's bad news, not good news. Because Christ gives grace. Man says, do, Christ says, done. It's it's, it's very much a grace-based faith, whereas if you follow through with what a man-centered thing, it's, 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 it's go and do. Go and do this so you may be saved. Prove it. Jesus says, I've already proved it. Just have faith in what I've done. Have faith in me. And out of your love for me, you will do things, but it won't be guilt-based. I've told Julie so many times that I don't like, I don't like to do anything out of guilt. I don't like to do things out of guilt. And if somebody tries to guilt me into it, I'm most likely not even going to do it. That sounds bad. The Lord's never guilted me into serving him. Jesus Christ never guilted me into it. The Lord loved me into it. So when he loved me into it, I said, you know what, you're worth it. I'm going to do it. So what are you doing? Let's look here. It's, it's your motivation. What is our motivation for what we're doing? When we think about the grace and the peace that God has given us, what is our motivation? Look at verse 10. Paul says, For I do not persuade men, or God, for do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And again, let me reference to the New Living Translation. This verse goes like this. It says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Listen, my goal is not to please you. My goal is not to please um, the, the church, my goal is not to even please myself. My goal in my life is to please Jesus Christ. And if we're trying to please other people, listen, when you're looking for the acceptance of somebody else, you're, you're living a false life. You're living a false life. The only person that I should be living to please is Jesus Christ. I can't be for you what you think I should be for you. 
I can't be because I don't know what everything that means. But I do know what it means when Jesus tells me what I need to be. So I submit to his lordship and I try to follow him as best I can. Do I fail? Yes. Do I sin? Yes. Will you fail? Yes. Will you sin? Yes. But that's okay. It isn't accept. I'm not like, it isn't like it's, it's okay to sin. I'm not saying that. But you need to understand, God understands that because we are, we have a sin nature, we're going to sin again. God just says, come to me. God's not looking to squish you like a bug. God's looking to hug you like a son or a daughter. You know, every analogy breaks down at some point. But when, when I think about how the Lord, the, the Lord is not, his love does not cease for me because I fail. He knew that I had failed. He knew when he got on the cross that I had failed. He knew when he came off the cross that I was going to fail again. His love for me does not change. His love for me does not change. So I, I'm going to do what I do to please him. Because you know what? If I fail you, I don't know if you're going to love me or not. And I'm not trying to say that negatively to anybody in this room. But I'm just telling you, if I failed you, I don't know. If, if I failed you, if I failed this student ministry, if I failed in the music, if I failed in, in, in associate pastoring, if I failed in, in any way to this church, I don't know how they would respond. But let me tell you something. This is the deal. I know how my Father in heaven will respond. And he will forgive me. And that's what you need to understand. He will forgive you. The Lord says, the Bible tells the Lord desires a broken and contrite heart. That's one that will come humbly before him and say, I have sinned against you. I desire your forgiveness. And I want to live differently. And just because you sin does not mean you're not his if you have made a confession of faith, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. But listen. If you think you can't go back to him to ask for forgiveness and then pursue a a different life, then listen. You need to spend more time with the Father. So you can know his heart. Because his heart is not to push anybody away. If it was to push anybody away, he could have done that a long time ago. But it's his desire to come close. It's his desire to come near The Bible tells us, draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. Draw near unto him. Come to him. It's not, I'm not here to please men. So our motivation is a big deal. And then lastly, verses 11 and 12, it's by revelation. So first off, he's like, I'm shocked at what, what you're doing. Secondly, he says, let me explain to you my motivation of preaching the gospel. And then he says, listen, this is how the gospel came to me. This is it. Okay, he says in verse 11, but I make known to you, brethren, and brethren is, is, encompasses all those churches at Galatia. He says, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. It's not according to man. It's not something that they've laid out and they've told me this is how you do it. He says, for I neither received it from man nor was taught it from man. I put that in, in brackets, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. When, when, did, uh, when did Paul come to faith in Christ? What happened? We talked about it a little bit last week. Where was it where, where Paul came to faith? That's right, the road to Damascus. That's where he came to faith. It was by revelation of Jesus Christ that he came to faith in, in, in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, as the Messiah, Okay? Because that was the big deal, you know. Israelites were looking for the Messiah to come. Listen, I I don't know if you're watching The Chosen. I know I speak about this a lot. But like episode two of season two, where Jesus speaks to Nathaniel. Oh man, it's powerful. Sometimes those things make me want to just break out of this series and just 
preach sermons based upon on those things. But like when he preached, when he speaks to Nathaniel at the closing of that episode, oh my goodness, if you don't get chill bumps, I mean, I mean, it had me crying. I'm thinking about, wow, that's just, could you imagine? This was Nathaniel, just, just to give you a little bit. This is by revelation, if you will. Nathaniel's sitting underneath the fig tree. He's very upset. Something bad has happened in his life. He thinks he's lost it all. And everything that he had, he had been devoting to God. Okay, to God. Because he's a, he's a Jew. He's devoted his life to God. Okay? He hasn't come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He hasn't even really been introduced to him very well yet. Okay? So he's sitting underneath the fig tree. He's very upset. He's crying out, asking God to help him, to, to, to reveal himself there to him. And then later in the Bible and in the episode, uh, I can't remember who, who brings Philip, who brings Nathaniel to Jesus. But they're walking down the street, and Jesus says, you are the one who speaks truth. And uh, he says, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. And Nathaniel's like, you know, nobody knew I'd gone out to that fig tree. And then Jesus reaches out and he puts his hand on Nathaniel's shoulder. And Nathaniel looks at the hand on his shoulder. And, and he says, you, you are the Messiah. You are the Lord. Oh, wow. To, could you imagine being there in that moment? And you've been crying out to God. And nobody knew you were up there. And Jesus Christ puts his hand on your shoulder and says, I saw you at, your, at, at the lowest point. And I'm here for you now. And I am who I say I am. By revelation, Christ revealed himself to Nathaniel. And here, Paul says, For I neither received it, this gospel... I neither received it from man nor was taught it from man, but it, the gospel, came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, we come to understand who Christ is more and more by his word. This is good news. Listen, I'm probably one of the world's worst of waking up, I go in the kitchen, pour my coffee, I fix my honey nut Cheerio medley crunch, uh, pour that in my bowl, I sit down in there, I talk to my dog that's over in the kennel, and I open up my phone, I look at Facebook, look at Instagram, look at Twitter, while I'm eating, drinking my coffee, seeing everything that every single political post that this person and that person and even my mama can post on social media all these things it's just a bunch of bad news but if I want direct revelation if I want the gospel of Jesus Christ if I want good news this is where I gotta go this is where we've got to go you keep searching through your Snapchats. You keep searching through the Instagram. You keep searching through the social medias. You're not going to get a whole lot of good news. And you're going to get the fake side of just about everybody. They're going to post just the best stuff most of the time. But if you want the good news, the true good news, this is where you're going to get it. So we go to the Word of God. So tonight as we close, listen, if you want grace and peace, as Paul offers to us, and he says he brings it to us. Listen, I bring it tonight. I bring grace and peace. Not because it's my grace. And not because it's my peace. It's because it's my Savior that I bring with me. So I'm offering my Savior to you. My Lord. And if you want grace and peace, all you've got to do is place your faith in Him. And you can experience those things. I want you to bow your heads. Listen tonight. Grace and peace is not something even in the Christian walk that we, peace is not something we may always have in the Christian walk. 
there's still a lot of strife, difficulties, at times turmoil that we go through. But I want to tell you this. To understand the fullness of peace, you've got to understand the fullness of grace. So tonight, if you've never done that before, if you have never experienced the grace of God, if tonight you say, Brother Blake, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised his son from the dead. I want to tell you something. If this is the first time you've ever said those two things and you, and you tell the Lord, I am a sinner in need of you. I need a Lord of my life. If that's you tonight, you've never done that before, I want you to raise your hand. If tonight you say, Brother Blake, I want to make sure that I'm living a life that's pleasing to the Lord and not men. Now listen, if you're living a life that's pleasing the Lord, it's going to please a lot of men. But it's also going to bring you a lot of enemies too. Because a lot of people don't like Jesus. A lot of people don't like what he stands for. But I want to tell you this, if you're living to please the Lord, then you're going to be living a life that will be a lot more pleasing to those around you. You say, Brother Blake, please pray for me because I want to live a life that pleases the Lord. If that's you, raise your hand. I know I want to live a life that pleases the Lord. I'm going to fail him. But he knows that. That's the reason why he died on the cross. All right, let me pray for us as we close. Father God, I thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your peace. Every single one of us needs it. But Lord, uh, I don't know how many of us uh, have experienced it. Lord, I know many have. But Lord, you, you, you alone know the heart. So Lord, tonight I pray that you'll just continue to work in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you come and give us grace, and you come and you give us peace. Lord, I pray for these students, these, these adult leaders. God, I pray that you'll be with them this week. Help them, Lord, to live a life that is pleasing to you. Lord, help me to live a life that is pleasing to you. God, we thank you for all you've done for us, and Lord, we'll give you all the honor, glory, and praise and all these things we ask in Jesus' name.